Welcome to Spirits of Whiskey. We explore the wide world of whiskey through the many colorful personalities who make it, promote it, write about it, and more. With each podcast, Carrie Moynihan, a certified bourbon steward and bartender, and yours truly, Philip Dobar, director of the Cocktail Collection, interview whiskey's most important names. From high-profile makers, blenders, and ambassadors. To out-of-the-way innovators and remote pioneers. Join us as we discover the people and elements that give the water of life its spirit. It is Whiskey Wednesday, December 16th, 2020, and you're listening to episode 27. Today, we speak with Julianne Van Winkle III about Pappyland, the new authorized biography by Wright Thompson. But first, stay tuned for this week's Whiskey Chronicles. Hey, do you like whiskey, food, and adventure? I do. Hi, I'm Carrie. I'm Philip. I'm Louise. I'm the chef. Chef Louise Leonard, as in our World of Wheezy segment host here on the podcast, and Whiskey, A Chef's Journey. That chef. That's right, the project that started this very podcast. The series stars our very own chef, Louise Leonard, winner of Emmy-winning The Taste on ABC. And explores and connects the worlds of whiskey and food, city by city, country by country. Would you like to see this spirited culinary adventure on a TV near you? Well, you can by helping us finish the pilot episode through our crowdfunding campaign. For more information, including behind-the-scenes photos, videos, and incentives. And to make a pledge, visit our website, whiskeyachefsjourney.com. Or search for our campaign, Whiskey A Chef's Journey, at gofundme.com. That's gofundme.com now. Well, I think it's a cheers to that. (laughs) Let's. Cheers. Cheers. Whiskey has made a comeback all around the world over the last 15 years or so, therefore it's no surprise that the price of American whiskey has risen. One reason for this, of course, is the obvious relationship between supply and demand. Since it takes 10 years to age a 10-year-old whiskey, the supply of whiskey during what we like to call the brown liquor drought dwindled. Lower production in year zero yields smaller supply in year 10. And so, once the flood of increased demand ended in a whiskey drought, basic economics dictated higher prices. There are also other factors, such as taxes that distilleries pay government entities, and changes in the price of glass bottles, as well as other economic factors, not the least of which is demand, all of which contribute to a steady rise in the manufacturer's suggested retail price, or MSRP, of distilled spirits. American whiskey pricing, unfortunately, has an additional and very powerful economic undercurrent that's having a profound effect on what a bottle of bourbon is supposed to cost. Many flippers make a living by hunting down hard-to-find bourbons and other whiskeys, buying out the stock of retailers, then reselling them online at a dramatic, sometimes exorbitant, markup. This is what's known as the secondary market. Today, there's a mania for certain brands that's expanding dramatically. Ten years ago, for example, one might have heard about collectors going to great lengths to obtain bottles of premium bourbon that had fewer units on the retail shelves than other American whiskeys. Brands such as Pappy Van Winkle, because its production is so limited, were increasingly difficult to find. So, many collectors shifted their search to Buffalo Trace's W.L. Weller. This is because both weeded bourbons were made from the same mash bill. As Weller became harder to find, the mania shifted again, and again, and again, to a point that a frenzy built for seemingly every Buffalo Trace brand. And it's not just Buffalo Trace products. As time passes, the practice of gouging on any spirit, but particularly whiskey, that generates a certain level of hype is becoming normalized. The result? Up to 500% markups from MSRP on in-demand bottles, such as Heaven Hill's Old Fitzgerald Bottled in Bond, Four Roses Small Batch Limited Edition, Michter's Toasted Barrel Rye, and Brown Foreman's Old Forester Birthday Bourbon. So why don't distilleries just step in and say, hey, don't go marking up our products by 500%? Because legally they can't. In the United States, due to the three-tier system of distribution, distilleries are barred from setting maximum prices on their products. This system, a lingering legacy of the political bargaining surrounding prohibition's repeal, distances distilleries from distributors and distributors from retailers. So what's really the only corrective action that will eliminate price gouging in secondary markets? Stop paying for whiskey at higher inflated prices. Perhaps try some new brands that are more widely available, so the MSRP can be maintained across the very many great whiskeys being made today. Up next, we speak with Julian Van Winkle III, who talks to us about author Wright Thompson's new book, Pappyland, and shares his thoughts on the secondary market. Stay with us. 
Today on Spirits of Whiskey, we are very fortunate to have with us Mr. Julian P. Van Winkle III. Julian is president of the Old Rip Van Winkle Distillery, maker of Pappy Van Winkle bourbon and dry, and he is the subject of a new book, Poppyland, a story of family, fine bourbon, and the things that last, an authorized biography penned by Wright Thompson. Welcome, Julian. Thank you all. Thanks, Philip. Glad to be here. Yes, thank you for coming. Quick question. The P, I know you have a son named Preston. Is the P for Preston? This time it is not. We <laughs> like to make it complete, keep everybody on their toes around here. But I'm Julian Proctor Van Winkle the third, obviously. Father, grandfather before me, but I figured three was enough. <laughs> and, uh, we're not British royalty, so. But your whiskey royalty. Indeed. <laughs> Some people say that, but uh, he's Julian Preston Van Winkle, and he goes by Preston. So uh, very confusing. Same initials, different name. So you deprive your perhaps grandson to a fifth, which is a crime exactly. against a man of whiskey. Exactly. Well, <laughs> he'll probably be okay with that. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Well, as you know, we start every show with asking about your whiskey journey, and yours, I feel, is a little bit more unique than most because it starts long before you were born. So if you want to start with your particular journey from how you were raised, your upbringing, your birthplace, how your name came to be. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, were you expected to take in the family business or was it something that you wanted to do? And then after that, we can talk about your dad and your grandfather. Sure. Well, at, um, generation wise, I'm the third, obviously my son Preston's the fourth and the pappy, my grandfather, that name came about from a friend of his, a good friend of his, I guess, once he got into the business, called him Pappy, and it kind of stuck. And so Julian P. Van Winkle Sr., born in Danville, Kentucky, went to Center College there. And after college, he went to get a job in Louisville, Kentucky, at the W.L. Weller & Sons Wholesale House. And uh, he was a salesman for them. And they sold not only whiskey, but a lot of different beverages and products, um, not just um, you know bourbon. They had rye and had some wine back in the day mm -hmm. and so forth. And this is 1893, so it's well before Prohibition. And he became one of their sales reps and worked the northern Kentucky area, horse and buggy, obviously, back in the day, uh, across the river from Cincinnati, and uh, was out on the road for weeks and months at a time, it seemed like, but became very versed in the business. And uh, one of his partners was Alex Farnsley and sales rep also. After a period of time, they became officers in the company, and the uh, Stitzel Distillery was in Louisville also. Um, so William LaRue Weller, and uh, his Weller family, um, the sales distribution part of the business, uh, hooked up with Mr. Stitzel, who made the whiskey for them. And uh, after Prohibition, Pappy and Mr. Farnsley and Mr. Stitzel built the Stitzel Weller Distillery in Louisville and uh, opened up Derby Day in 1935. Mm -hmm. That was where it all started as far as our family. That alone is a great story. Yes. You know, people have asked me, did, did Pappy go to the Derby that day? And I said, no, I think he was pretty busy at the distillery. <laughs> Um, you know, opening day. And he wasn't much of a racehorse fan. And I guess that carried over to, to my dad, who was not much of a racist guy. And as far as going to the horse races, and I, I enjoy it every now and then, but not an aficionado like most of the people here in Kentucky. But it's fun to do. And that distillery, their main brands that uh, Mr. Stitzel and Pappy and Mr. Farnsley produced were old Fitzgerald at the time and Cabin Still. And eventually, my dad, they bought the Rebel Yell label from another Mr. Farnsley here in Kentucky and also W.L. Weller, obviously, is one of their main brands. So they were all weeded bourbon whiskey, which is what we still make. And that's, we've carried on with that formula up until, I mean, up until uh, the present time. Dad joined the distillery after college and worked a couple of years there. And then he went to, joined up in World War II. He was in the Pacific Theater as a tank commander. Wow. And after the war, he, stationed in the Philippines, and he was actually wounded over there for quite a while, mm. which really, he was upset only because he couldn't be out there, you know, taking care of his men, because mm. he was a captain. Was he a Marine? No, he's the U.S. Army. Anyway, after the war, he joined with Pappy at the, at the distillery. Uh, Mr. Farnsley and Mr. Stitzel had passed away at that point before World War II, so our family was running and operating the distillery. Mm. And Pappy Passed away in 1965, and Dad continued to operate the distillery with our Uncle King, who was my dad's sister's husband. Mm -hmm. Her name is Mary Chenault Van Winkle McClure, and um, ah. that's it's the, the family name. Right, hence right. the triplets, uh, Chenault. Hence Winkle the namesake, McClure, one, of the, one of the triplets. It's yeah. the family name, right, right. Family name, and obviously 
her daughter was Chenault mm-hmm. and uh, our daughter Chenault also, but her nickname was, was Rip. So uh, up till the day she died when she was 92 or 94 or something, uh, she was known as Rip. So, and rest in uh, peace, Rip. Exactly. <laughs> so Pappy <laughs> passed away at the age of 91 and, and she fell into her 90s also. So the, uh, the lineage was pretty good there sure. as far as uh, staying power. Very strong woman. She was great. Uh-huh. But um, dad and Uncle King operated the uh, distillery until 1972 and mm-hmm. bourbon business in the late 60s and early 70s was not great so dad yeah yeah was forced to sell the distillery he was dwelling in darkness at the time yeah the light whiskeys and the vodkas were taking over mm-hmm. as everybody knows it was um it was tough for the whiskey business so um we just couldn't hang on to the distillery ourselves so uh, dad was forced to sell it but he did keep the old rip van winkle brand which is one of the brands that he bought a few years before he sold the distillery. So that's when he started the old Rip Van Winkle brand, which he never really used at, at Stitzel Weller, but had planned on it, but just never really put out a particular old Rip package. So he was able to buy some whiskey that actually he had made at Stitzel Weller. So they sold it back to him, so to speak. And he started bottling at Stitzel Weller. They bottled his whiskey for him, but uh, that's where he kind of started back in, in the business. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This was 1972. And I, after school, I Got another job. So, well, I really wasn't going to work for dad right off the bat. You know, I just kind of want to go my own way, do my own thing for a few years. But always with the I, intention of returning to the to the family business? Uh, not specifically. It just, you know, I wasn't really sure which way I was going to go. But the, probably in the back of my mind, not knowing it, I would wanted to be in the business just because I'd grown up with it and grew up hanging around Stitzel Weller, mm-hmm. you know, on the weekends. Were you fantasizing at that being an astronaut or a doctor or one of Nothing these things. Nothing like that. No, no. no. My, uh, okay. my, my ambitions were, I don't know what they were, but <laughs> yeah, it, it, it could have been, I'm sure it was a, a seed planted back there somewhere. So where'd you go to school and what did you study? I went to a couple of different prep schools in Virginia, Woodbury Forest and Blue Ridge School, and mm-hmm. then stayed in Virginia, went to Randolph-Macon College in Ashland, Virginia. Okay. And uh, I was in economics was obviously one of the mm-hmm. courses I focused on, but Ended up was there for three years and came back to Louisville to finish up school. Okay. And then at that point, I got this job in Louisville, actually at a clothing store here in town for about four or five years. Wow. A haberdasher. Yeah, yeah. And it was a great deal as far as buying clothes because you would get the cost <laughs> minus whatever percent. So it was, uh, I had a pretty good wardrobe back then anyway. <laughs> <clears throat> I knew I didn't want to make a career of that. Matter of fact, they wanted the people that owned the store. That's why you work at Rip Van Winkle, so you can get the employee discount. Exactly. Well, <laughs> I wish I could get some of that employee discount. <laughs> Just really tough to do, but... Uh, Sorry. Just, do you get an employee discount at uh, Pappy and Co? Uh, yeah, actually, I do. They're very... Yeah. You know, alcohol is one thing, but selling dry goods is another thing, uh-huh. so that's good. Right. They send you baseball caps? Oh, yeah. The daughters are nice <laughs> enough to uh, lay a little stuff on me every okay. now and then. So all, right, all, right. all right. I'm sorry. Back to the main story. Sorry. Couldn't resist. <laughs> that's fine. And the owners of the clothing store, like I said, I'd been there four or five years. They asked me if I wanted to become a buyer and so forth, which kind of, I kind of, you know, looked down the road and said, well, I'm not sure I want to stay in the clothing business my whole life. It was fine, but um, I think probably I'll hop off and, uh, and, and join my dad and work for him. So he actually asked my wife, Sissy, that, um, she asked him or asked her, do you think Julian would want to work for me? And she said, well, why don't you ask him? <laughs> <laughs> so he did. And I said, yes. And so that's when I started working for him. And that was 1977. Right, right, right. Uh, he was a tough guy. He was, uh, you know, he was in the army and he really loved it. And um, I think I was his PFC, it seemed like. Uh-huh, that. So I was, uh-huh. uh, I was uh, okay. uh, just one of the one of the grunts in his platoon, so to speak. Mm. But no, we had a good relationship and it was fun working with him. And obviously he knew a lot about the business and, and he brought me along for just really four years. He passed away in 1981 after I uh, joined him in 77 of uh, prostate cancer. So mm. I was mm. handed the business with not knowing a whole lot how to run it and, you know, business wise. And, and there's a lot to learn. And I was by myself and it was a expensive deal and kind of, you know, had to learn it by the seat of my pants, so to speak. But um, mm-hmm. had a lot of help through the years. And my son, Preston, who's our oldest child, he got out of school and went to the University of Kentucky and graduated in 2001. So I grabbed him the day after he <laughs> got out of school. <laughs> um, I, after dad passed away, old Fitzgerald slash Stitzel Weller was doing our bottling for us. Mm-hmm. But um, when dad passed away, they kindly asked me to 
go find somewhere else to bottle the whiskey because they, were, oh, well, they, they were really just doing it as a favor. They weren't in the bottling business, uh-huh. so um, I can understand that. So we, I bought this little bottling plant in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, just down the road from Louisville, about fifty minutes, mm-hmm. and I owned that until nineteen uh, two thousand two. But when I got Preston after the day he graduated from school, I put him to work. So we doubled our our salary and doubled our employee count by one <laughs> <laughs> from the great the great bottling facility in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky. Mm-hmm. So uh, there's a lot about that in the book and so forth. But uh, mm-hmm. it, right. it did its job and it kept me in business, although it was very expensive to keep me in business because selling the whiskey was profitable, but running that little bottling facility was a huge money pit. So that mm. was, was kind of tough. Okay. Yeah. Did Preston always want to join you or was it just like he said, okay, well, dad wants me, so I'm going. It was kind of, we had a kind of a similar path in that he wasn't really thinking about it. I don't think too seriously as far as working for me, but the bourbon Kentucky bourbon festival, which normally is held in September every year, mm-hmm. obviously this year it wasn't, but um, right. back then we set up a booth, the big fancy Saturday night soiree, so to speak of it is a two hour tasting and then a, a dinner and dance. So to speak so to speak, in Bardstown. And we had a tasting booth that a fellow helped me out designing, and it looked like Pappy's study. It was all mahogany-looking, oh. oh, wow. artificial fireplace, and his portrait above the fireplace, and a bookcase, and wing chairs. It was quite impressive. So, you know, having a really good whiskey and kind of a new guy on the block, um, as far as competing with the Maker's Marks and the Beams and the Heaven Hills and so forth, we got a lot of good feedback from uh, people trying our whiskey so we had quite a crowd there so he was taken with that i asked preston and at least one or two of his sisters uh were in town to do it so we um they kind of helped out so they they all kind of got the bug at that point so i think that's where he figured out that he would like to be a part of this whiskey thing okay so, um, cool that's that's where that started so we and what year was that well it would have been late 90s i guess okay. yeah, before we hooked up with buffalo trace which was 2002 all right all right so 2001, the Pappy label was one that I created after I found that picture of Pappy on the label, lighting a cigar. I love that photo. I found that picture. I, mean, I just found that picture in our basement in a file. So I, I had some older whiskey that we hadn't sold at you know, 15, 16, 17 years old or whatever. So I like to honor Pappy with a 20-year-old bourbon. So designed that label with, some, with an artist, a friend of mine, and and that's when it was about 1995, 96 when that came out. So that was, you know, started a pretty good, very slow start. Because the whiskey wasn't cheap and um, I didn't sell it for a lot of money. I think back then, the 20 year, the first price we had was below 50 bucks. So, uh, oh, wow. Um, but this I need was, a time machine. <laughs> <laughs> so 1995, a long time ago, or 96, he helped me out. And um, the bottling facility was, we did a lot of contract bottling for some other labels. Mm-hmm get me going but uh, i knew i wasn't putting any whiskey away for the future and uh, buffalo trace uh, bought the wl weller label in 1999 uh, because the uh, uh, diageo or united distillers back then was uh, run, still running stitzel weller and they sold off all the bourbon labels that we had which were the four labels fitzgerald weller Gravel yell and cabin still they ended up selling them all uh, two other distilleries, Buffalo Trace ended up with the Weller brand. So they wanted to hook the Van Winkle slash back, you know, with Weller. They wanted that uh, relationship to kind of fire up again. So they asked me to do a joint venture with them. And I, at first, I wasn't wild about the idea because I've been doing my own thing for so long. But after a couple of nights of good sleep, I've realized that this is probably <laughs> going to be a good thing because I wasn't putting down a whiskey for the future, mm-hmm. which is very expensive to do when you age sure, of course. 20, 20 right. something years. So that's was finalized in roughly mid 2002, June, 2002, our joint venture with Buffalo trace. So now they do all our distilling for us to our old weeded recipe and, and the warehousing and bottling and so forth. So mm-hmm. it's a good relationship yeah. going on for 18 so years. And as a division of Sazerac Company, it is well capitalized and yes, thus able able to market. Right. They have marketing might, let's just say. Right. As I mentioned, it takes uh, quite a bit of capital to put a bunch of barrels away every year for mm-hmm. ten to twenty three years. So that's uh, right. Unless you've unless it unless you've bonded it, you have to sit and watch it and watch it bleed money until you can put it on the market. Yep. yep. And then you also need to have space to keep. Putting exactly. things in, yeah. 
you know, when I look back on it, there's, I'm not sure how our family could have kept Stetzel Weller because they out putting away whiskey like that for so long. Mm-hmm. It'll make you go broke in no time. And mm-hmm. so it's a tough business, but luckily mm-hmm. we have some good partners that can afford to do that. So it's mm-hmm. worked out pretty mm-hmm. well. So the older, the ones that you're making into 20, 25 years, do those age at your facility or do they, you go to Buffalo Trace somewhere? Kind of a mixture. We, I had some at our, at my Lawrenceburg plant. Um, you know, when we did the joint venture, we took some of the barrels that I had stored and shipped into Buffalo Trace and Stetson Weller had some barrels and, and Buffalo Trace had their own inventory of weeded whiskey. So uh, they came from a little bit of everywhere. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And you came into some legacy barrels, did you not? That the Stitzel Weller owner said, here, you want these? Yeah. The late 90s bourbon was still, you know, there's tons of it floating around. Uh huh. A lot of distilleries buy each other's bulk whiskey, depending on if they're short of whiskey of one brand, they'll, they'll buy the whiskey and sell it in a different market because the flavor profile will be different. But I knew Stitzel Weller had older whiskey and they were actually taking some of that to blend in with a Canadian whiskey brand that they own. So mm-hmm. uh, uh, that was blasphemy as far as I was concerned, but <laughs> right. really, really good bourbon that they, you know, nobody, it was not a popular bourbon wasn't popular. So uh, it was just juice to them. So, uh, but to me, I knew it was valuable. So we were able to contract with them and get, get a good supply mm-hmm. for uh, quite a while. And that's how you were able to introduce these super annuated, if you will, these super aged bourbons mm-hmm. using older stock that you had uh, had the good fortune of coming into. Right, right. So it all worked out well. And then we're still trying to get, you know, that the supply situation is not good as far as the demand. I mean, it's, we make more every year. And, you know, we can get into that if you all want to, but it's, we've made a lot more whiskey every year for the last 18 years, but mm. the demand is increasing. So uh, the right. demand is, well, because you're kind of a popular guy. I'm not complaining. I'm just telling you, I'm trying to explain the situation. Yeah, as 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 I'm 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 fond of saying, unmet demand is a happy problem. Yep. Well, it's my grandfather always said, you know, if you, make, you what you want to do is make a really good product and keep it in key, seemingly short supply because mm-hmm. you don't want to completely fill everybody's demand, so to speak. Right. So as, as everybody knows, uh, supply and demand is can affect the price of the product and so forth. So we yeah. uh, we're doing the best we can, but we're still short of whiskey, and um, we didn't have enough older whiskey to sell down the road. So we've had to just cut our supply and so forth. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we're, we're working on getting it up to the demand, but uh, I don't think we'll ever make it, to be honest with you. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I think that's part of the charm about your whiskey is that it's so hard to come by that people like just will do whatever it takes to get it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, they do. It's crazy. It's, it's. I mean, human nature is such that if, they, if it's in short supply, people think they've got, that gives them reason to really, want to find it and, and own it and, or give it away and so forth. So it's, it's a good thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I just got this flash of my childhood and I don't know if it's that great of an analogy, but it reminds me of the eighties when the cabbage patch dolls were the biggest thing and nobody mm-hmm. could get them for Christmas, you know, right, and right. Cause they were fighting for them all of the, I mean, they've, I've seen other things like some Elmo doll did that once, but mm-hmm. I've never seen anything quite as crazy as that in my lifetime. Right, yeah. right, yeah. I kind of feel like that's how your whiskey is that people are like. <laughs> uh, there's a lot, a lot of that stuff. There's a ton of it around. So it's that's just like I say, it's human nature. Mm-hmm. Yeah, indeed. Yes, which leads us to the book, which is you know what is currently out right now and what we wanted to promote to help uh, sales for Christmas because I think it's a fabulous book. Mm-hmm. So how did this book come about? Did Wright call you up and say, hey, I'm interested in doing this thing? Or did you say, if anyone wants to do a book and there was other bidders out there saying that they wanted to do it and you decided he was the one to tell? How did that come about? Well, it sure wasn't my idea because I'm not kind of a quiet guy and not really want to put myself out there too much. So mm-hmm. I was very skeptical about the whole thing. But through our business and a great outfit called the Southern Food Ways Alliance, which is out of Oxford, Mississippi. At Ole Miss in Oxford. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. At Ole Miss. It uh, promotes Southern food and culture and writings and documentaries. Right. Run by John T. Edge. Right. John mm-hmm. T. is a good buddy of mine. He, matter of fact, he reviewed our rye whiskey back when it first came out years and years ago. Mm-hmm. So I've known him a long time. But through that charity, we have met a lot of chefs, southern, mostly Southern chefs around the country. And I think John Currents, who's a chef in Oxford also that Wright Thompson knows very well, He's got several restaurants there. You know, all these chefs put out cookbooks. It seems like two or three a year, it seems like. There are a lot of cookbooks out there. But he, his agent in New York 
since John knew me and Bourbon was, this is probably three or four years ago, at least I'd say. Those two got together, I think, and, and said, well, let's, you know, maybe Julian do a book about Julian and, and we'll get right to write it because, you know, they knew him very well. You know, that we'll just, um, not sure how it's going to go or what it's going to be, what this book is going to be a biography or just a fiction or nonfiction or whatever. But, um, Wright was on board for it. So we, kind of talk, tossed it about and nobody really had an idea of how it was going to turn out or who, whether it was going to be first person, third person, or whether it was going to be his voice, my voice, whatever. So eventually he just kind of came to write and he just started writing it down two or three years ago. And it was about, a, I think it took him at least two and a half years to get this thing done because it, he's a busy guy. He's a sports writer for ESPN and had his own book come out last year. So uh-huh. It wasn't a hundred percent writing this book about Julian Van Winkle. It was uh, in between his real job, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, he's known for writing biographies of uh, famous athletes. Yes, yes, he, and he knows a lot of them too. See, so we he, didn't know you were a famous athlete. That's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're a pot still jockey. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's about it. <laughs> like I say, it was. Uh, I was very skeptical about the whole thing, but um, then we started sending drafts to us and. We kind of and wove this story of his life with his father and my life with my father and kind of a parallel situation. And the whiskey part of it is is really a it's in the book. Obviously. It takes a while to get to that part. Actually. It does. It's, it's not a, it's, yeah. it's not all about that. It's it's more of a, a personal relationship with family and uh, how whiskey can be used to uh, create friendships with people and enjoy with people and so forth. So uh, he really nailed it with his uh, the way he put it all down and his his verbiage is incredible he's his word he's a wordsmith yeah he can describe stuff that you just have to sit back and go wow i can't believe that uh, somebody can describe something like that but uh, he does it over and over in the book was your first meeting at churchill downs no we actually met at a probably an sfa uh, event in atlanta okay a year or two before that i would say and but like after after it was decided to do the book was that no that was before i think yep this was okay. this was probably a year or two, year and a half mm-hmm. before the book idea came up. Mm-hmm. We weren't great friends, but we had become great friends because every now and then he would drive up to Louisville or meet me at the distillery or whatever. So it turned out great. Yeah. Well, you had to open up. Yeah. You had to open up to him. You had to download a lot of data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's good at extracting information. <laughs> that, well, he's a journalist, of course. Right. Very good at it, too. I really did like how he did intertwine, you know, his story with your story and how we got to get to know him as well as I got to know you. I thought that was a very unique approach to this kind of a book. Mm-hmm. Did you have any reservations or did the brand have any reservations officially or unofficially about opening up? Well, in the last few years, we haven't done a lot of these interviews. We haven't, um, you know, we've been asked to do articles and be on television, this and that. And we just kind of want to keep it on the down low because there's no sense in promoting something that is really hard to find. And people, most people <laughs> can't find it unless you get on this aftermarket, uh, the secondary market where that's where the prices are through the roof. So right, right. We, we really kind of been shunning as much publicity as we can. We want to put ourselves out there a little bit, but not a whole lot. So I was a little nervous about doing this and people will see the story, see the book. Oh, there they go promoting their brand again. But it's like I said. But you can buy the whiskey. <laughs> right. Exactly. So <laughs> it just angers people if they read something and, and get fired up about something and they can't find it unless it's, you know, two or three thousand bucks on the on the damn mm-hmm. internet or something. <laughs> well, then they should start going to Pappy and Co and getting all the barrel aged products that exactly. are available That's, there because they are fantastic. Yeah, and, and the girls are reaping the benefits of uh, not people not being able to find their on their product because um, oh good 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 you know you did touch on something that i've heard well let me see if it's true i'm sure it probably is but you touched on the secondary market and how they overprice it and sell it i'm assuming that makes you rather mad because that's not what you would want to sell it for yeah i guess some of the people that see those prices think that maybe we're reaping the benefit Mm -hmm. from those huge prices but obviously we have a suggested retail price and our Mm -hmm. distributors have a regular markup and our retailers uh, asked Mm -hmm. to sell at a regular markup and some of them do and then some of them also take advantage of the scarcity so they mark the prices mm-hmm. up right. quite a bit but the worst you know the, the secondary market the worst part about number one being illegal because alcohol is very tricky to sell and indeed you have to have a, yeah. a license to do it right and that's all illegal totally but we're also worried about 
counterfeiting, which is happening. Mm-hmm. Oh, no. So if you buy a bottle of whiskey that's several hundred bucks or several thousand dollars, it could be something else in there. Right. Oh, that's awful. So that's, uh, that's why we really uh, don't recommend anybody buying anything except from a licensed dealer. Yeah, there's a whole, right. now there's a whole co- sort of cottage industry of investigation, uh, whiskey investigation. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yep. there are sites popping up. And now if you look online at the range, uh, both Old Rip and Pappy, the suggested prices are all very reasonable, particularly given the quality and the demand, you know, running from $70 to $300, mm-hmm. excluding the 25-year-old. Right. But, you know, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, that's approachable. Yeah. It's- and <laughs> the consumer can't access those price points. Right. right. And But. You know, some people do, and they'll they'll pay anything to get it. But then that's the worrisome part for us is that uh, you know you may be getting duped by somebody who's uh, put something else in. Right, mm-hmm. and then if it tastes terrible, they'll say, "Oh, this wasn't even worth it." And yeah, that exactly. Makes it that, a, yeah, even that's worse. true. That's right. true. Now, on the twenty-five year, I see you guys have it in a Glencairn crystal. How did that come about? Did they approach you guys, or did you guys approach them to do the Glencairn? Um, we've been using their tasting glasses for years, and. Most distilleries do the, the very familiar looking little tasting mm-hmm. glasses that are. I have a full collection myself. Everybody <laughs> has. This 25 year old was a very, it was kind of an experiment we did. Preston and I were tasting our 23 year old barrels, and a few of them were just exceptionally really nice. So I wanted to have those age a little bit longer, another two years to see what would happen because mm-hmm. we never sold anything at 25. So it was just kind of an experiment. So we wanted to come up with a nice package. So the Glen Karen people came up with that bottle, and then we designed um, you know the etching it etching in it and the gift box that was made from old part of uh, some of the old barrels from the ones that we used so it was it was a fun project mm-hmm. that's cool but it's you know it was kind of a one-time event there were only 710 bottles mm. produced so it was a fun project was the suggested retail on the 25 that was i think 1200 dollars. okay all right wow which is now you can find online for thirty thousand us yeah <laughs> seriously <Exactly>. yeah <laughs> Seriously? Seriously. Wow. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. It's, I don't know if you're always paying those prices, but... Um, uh, Not me. You never know. <laughs> Someone with an image problem. <laughs> don't come looking for us, yeah. whoever you are. A lot of money floating around out there, yeah. so people can... Indeed. Can we talk about the expressions? You know, there are six in the standard range across two brands, mm-hmm. plus the 25, which you just say was a one-off. Right. But can we talk about sort of the order of introduction? You have two house brands, the old Rip Van Winkle mm-hmm. and the Pappy Van Winkle. And we also understand that some bars are menu labeling the Pappies as old Rips. Right. Why? So anyway, can we talk about the division of the brands and the order of introduction of the expressions? Sure. It's well. As I mentioned, the old Rip Van Winkle label was the original one. Mm-hmm. After you know, we sold the distillery, and that's what Dad started with. It's, it's the only IP you had held on to, right? Right. Through the the changing of hands, that was it. And we did have a label called Old Commonwealth, which Dad owned also, mm-hmm. or started, and it was used for our decanters, which was a big popular thing in the 70s and 80s the lifestyle right all, all these different bottles that a lot of distilleries did mm-hmm. people didn't care about the whiskey back then they right. just wanted to buy the containers right. um, now if they find those containers they don't care about the containers but the whiskey in there is really good from back then so that's oh, yeah. the, it's funny how it's all but old rip was the first one and dad bottled that first at seven years old and um uh when i got some of this stick stitzel weller stock in the 90s i changed it to 10 so mm-hmm. And then I came out with the 12-year-old Van Winkle Special Reserve. Mm-hmm. And then, actually, back then, the 15-year was also an old Van Winkle package okay. instead of a Pappy. And the Pappy, the original Pappy label was 20-year-old. And then I did the 23-year-old as a real, very premium product. And then years later, switched the old Rip label to a 15-year-old Rip to a, a Pappy label. Mm-hmm. And um, same whiskey, just different packaging, mm-hmm. so to speak. So the Pappy is the key word, so to speak. It's the one that people know about. And uh, so they tend to relate to all of our brands as Pappy. You sure, know, that's, right. You know, old Rip or Van Rickle Special Reserve. Right. What year did you introduce the Pappy variant? Uh, I think it was about 95 or 96 okay. when we first started bottling it, right? Okay. All right. So it's pre-Sazerac. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. All right. All right. Um, now, the proof points, there's quite a range in the proof points, starting at 107 with the 10 year. And I'm assuming you, like most whiskey makers, you've reached these proofs as the happy balance of heat and flavor. Yeah, it's, that's part of it. But um, the 107 proof, as far as our family, that was our entry proof, which means that the proof 
we would put the whiskey into the barrel mm -hmm. to start aging at 107. So it was our barrel proof, so to speak. Okay. So that's always been kind of a popular number. Mm -hmm. So originally, our I had 90 proof and 107 proof 10 year, mm -hmm. and we were so short, obviously, of each of those that we just discontinued the 90 proof. So if you want 90 proof, send me an email and I'll tell you how to reduce it down to our 107 <laughs> proof down to 90. But, uh, it's just simply add your own water. There's nothing to it. Have your chemistry lesson with your with your dram. <laughs> Pretty easy. But the 107 proof, it is a lot of times, with, and I notice this with our 10-year-old, if you um, have the whiskey at, say, 120 proof, which it comes out of the barrel at that proof, if it does, the less water you add tends to make it less of a harsh feel on the tongue and less bite. So the barrel proof 107 was a lot of people would would taste it and they say wow that doesn't seem like it's one oh proof because it's so smooth so right that's why we do the the 10 year and the 15 year at 107 okay and the 90.4 was just kind of a for the 12 and the 20 years is kind of a number that dad used back in the day for just to make it a little bit different than just 90 proof or 95 proof or whatever make it a little bit different so mm -hmm. that's for those two and then the 23 is our 95.6 proof and i actually came to that proof because i would try when we first when i first put out the 23 year old and bottled it i wanted i tried it at different proofs you know 90 95 100 a little bit and so on and i thought the 95.6 was a nice middle point or nice a sweet spot point worth it yeah it was just right not mm -hmm. you know not too much alcohol but but more than uh, you know something that's just a 90 proof or so It'll give you a little more a little more flavor how about the 25 um uh, what was that i think it was oh that was uh oh that's 114. Ooh, okay. Um, oh, okay. Wow. think. No, that was honor proof. I'm sorry. Okay. The, uh, we did do a 23 year old decanter a few years ago, and that was a 114, uh -huh. which was, which is, is our barrel proof at this point. Okay. Now, All right. What about the 13 year old rye? Yeah. What year was that introduced? And what's the proof point? Yeah, that one, it's 95.6, and it's came out with it mid 90s also. Mm -hmm. You know, there were no old ryes back then. Indeed. But, uh, and you were very much ahead of the curve on introducing rye. Yeah, it was, again, I had a lot of help with this business. And uh, a customer that I sold whiskey to in Japan, she was a broker. She wanted, said her customers wanted old aged rye whiskey. Mm -hmm. And there was plenty of it floating around back in the mid 90s because you could buy it from you know, just about anybody that had it. There was a lot of rye whiskey sitting around because it wasn't a very popular brand, right. but um, mm -hmm. or popular category. Mm -hmm. It was always right. on the bottom shelf. Bean had a yellow label and Heaven Hill had one and there was a couple brands out there, but they're all very young. So mm -hmm. I tried it. It was um, 12 and 13 years old and it was fabulous. It was made by the Medley Distillery mm. and it just blew my mind how good that whiskey was. So hey, that was the mid nineties and it, it was, I saw Gary Reagan and Paul Picult at the bourbon festival one year and they showed him this rye label. Mm -hmm. Of course, them, Paul being a, a true blue Yankee and Gary <laughs> kind of living up in that part of the neck of the woods in New England, New York area. Indeed. Yeah. Upstate New York. Yeah. You know, they're big rye fans. So I said, okay, well I'll start selling it in, the, in this country. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of their idea that pushed me to, um, to sell it in this country. And, and the 13 year old is your only rye? Yes, it is. Yeah. When we first did it, we had a 12 and a 13 just for, I'm not sure exactly. The 12 year was an old Rip Van Winkle squat bottle and the 13 year was in the cognac style bottle that we still use today. Yeah. But now we just have a 13 year and that's it. Brief sidebar. I can't tell you over the course of this, uh, the life of this podcast, I can't tell you how many times Gaz Regan's name has been invoked. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He was very famous. He was great for the industry. Yeah. Yeah. Also very close to the cocktail collection. So yeah, exactly. a great man, much missed. Yeah, for sure. Indeed. So what's next? Do you have any new expressions that you're thinking about? Increased production? I mean, obviously you already said you every year you increase production. And when do you plan to retire and give the whole reins over to Preston? <laughs> That's a lot of questions right there. <laughs> um, you may not pick and um, choose in order, please. <laughs> we would like to do a lot of different fun things, but our supply kind of keeps us handcuffed as far as doing any, any new brands or new ideas till we get some decent supply and, and, and can afford to do that. So, uh, you know, we're working on a couple of things, but it's going to be a while before it, before it happens, just because we just can't hardly make anybody happy with, with uh, what we ship anybody these days. So we just have to hunker down and keep making more whiskey and, and maybe someday we'll be able to do something a little different. But it is a little frustrating not to be able to have new projects like everybody comes up with. But 
we're doing the best we can right now. So we're just kind of hunkered down, making whiskey. And I wish it would age a little faster, but you can't push it. <laughs> That's right. for sure. Yeah. And uh, the retiring part, I'm not. I don't know what I'd be doing. So I guess they'll have to kick me out at some point. <laughs> They're going to carry you out in a cask. Exactly. <laughs> uh, go straight to the uh, cemetery. I don't know what else I would do, but it's a uh, you know, Pappy did this. He built his new distillery when he was 61 years old. Wow. So most people think about retiring that. Yeah, when back read the bio, I'm like, oh, he was a mature adult. When he, yeah, yeah. Uh, and back then that was close to end of life, really. Yeah, right. Exactly. People start thinking about retirement. And he ran it for 32 years. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, uh, he had a long run, so to speak. Yeah. So, and my dad would have done the same thing if he hadn't passed away, mm-hmm. I'm sure. So you kind of have to just kick us out. Of- Pick us out. There's no way to get rid of us, I guess. <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah. And we know the quality is continuing all the time. Yep, that's great. Yep, that's yeah. true. So Preston will, um, I don't want to say replace you. Preston will succeed you. Sure. Yep. He works for the company and the whiskey part of it. And the girls mm-hmm. have their business. And uh, Yeah. Pappy and Co. We should give a shout out. All right. Yes. Let's talk about that really quick. Sure. What did you think when the girls came up with that idea? They said they came up with it. Uh, was it Michigan and at your your house up in was it Michigan or one of the great? Yeah, places? we go up there for a while in the summertime, and I guess Preston had we fiddled around with a few golf shirts and sweatshirts and hats, and there's a fellow named Billy Reed down in Alabama that has a company, a not really nice clothing company. So we kind of partnered with him to kind of just do some fun stuff, and so Preston had a had an old Rip Van Winkle gray. Like he came in a gray and black, kind of a hoodie, kind of just a cold weather kind of a thing to keep warm just for fun. And Chanel, my daughter, had one and uh, decided to sell it on eBay or something and got a bunch of money for it. So she said, whoa, this is kind of easy money. Let's, why don't we just come up with some cool ideas using the brand name and the rest is history. So we got the licensing agreement with them. They can use our brand to put on their products. And uh, sometimes they use part of our, I mean, our old Rip Van Winkle or the Pappy brand, and then they have their own logos. Mm -hmm. Also, they've been going at it for, gosh, I'm I'm hard to guess, five or six years, maybe four or five years. I can't remember how long it's been, but uh, they've started out small and they've really done a great job as far as marketing and presenting their products. And it's all online. We do have a little building downtown in Louisville that we tried. they wanted a storefront to do some retail space. Right. And then COVID came. So and the COVID thing. So that wasn't working out. So we kind of have put that on hold. But just like everybody else, this whole online thing is uh is really blown up. So mm-hmm. they've had a they've got a great piece of business this this year. Yeah. So do they bring the food items to you to taste to get your approval on any of it? Like the not really the hot sauce or no, no. <laughs> They're pretty good at picking that stuff out. <laughs> okay. um, you know, they if they if they do use our brand, they're supposed to run it by us, but uh, a lot of stuff just shows up sometimes. So hopefully they seem to forget that sometimes. But, uh, I think they're, forget old they're dad, that. old granddad, if you will. <laughs> right. I'd like to talk about the book a bit more and its reception. Let's just say it's been very favorably received yes. by the critical press mm-hmm. and people who are in a position to know whether something is good or not. I want to invoke uh, my fellow native New Orleanian and fellow Southerner, Walter Isaacson, mm-hmm. the great Walter Isaacson, who called it a beautiful antidote to false sentiment, which takes me to this whole notion of Southern culture and whiskey culture. When people learn I'm from New Orleans, they will say, oh, oh, you're a Southerner. And I will say, no, I'm a New Orleanian. Of course, I protest too much. Of course, I'm a Southerner. But, you know, it's a testament to, again, another sort of, you know, there's a whole mythology surrounding New Orleans. Right. And then they will say, oh, well, well, you're from NOLA. And I said, no, that means New Orleans is in Louisiana. And it is by accident of political history. (laughs) Anyway, there's this whole Southern mythos. And I'm happy to see Southerners leading the charge in busting it. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us about this whole notion of Southerness? And yes, it is a different place. It is special in many ways. But much of the myth is just that. And this book concerns itself with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm being from Kentucky. I've always been a fan of the South, you know, Southeastern Conference. You can't beat that. That's Everybody comes and goes. Indeed. Kentucky, I don't think they've won a basketball game this year so far. Maybe one. <laughs> yeah. Wildcats. Yeah. Not so much anymore from an athletic powerhouse to, uh, well, exactly. Exactly. And of course, right. Being a Southerner, born in Mississippi, um, Mm -hmm. we are both proud of the South. and We're proud of what it's done in the food culture and the the people from the South are the best and have a little bit of a, if you compare the South to the North, obviously 
it's a big difference and it's a different state of mind. Mm -hmm. The people are different. They say hello or don't say hello (laughs) differently (laughs) when you walk down the sidewalk. I'm glad that's part of the book. And it's a bourbon that's obviously Southern. Uh It sells more in the South than it does anywhere else in the country. Mm -hmm. And um, having been known in John T. Edge and and the Southern Food Buddies Alliance and the whole Southern culture, it's just something to be proud of. So it's uh, I'm glad it's it's brought mm-hmm. you know, it shows up in the book because that's very important to all of us mm-hmm. from the South for sure. Mm-hmm. It's also has a how shall I say this whole notion of the Southern Gothic. It's created this whole sort of cultural bubble around it that is being burst. And I think you know it, this is a good thing, acknowledging the South for all of its best and special qualities, and getting down to the people, the actual people who settled it, who developed it, and this notion of whiskey, this notion of whiskey as this, for a lot of people, unapproachable agricultural product when it is very much a people's drink. Yeah, the history of whiskey is the history of this country. It, it parallels quite yes. a bit. Indeed, beginning with rye. Exactly. And then evolving to bourbon as with westward expansion. Right. George Washington, the father of our country, mm-hmm. he was a huge distiller and he made rye whiskey and um, you know, they've resurrected his still there at Mount Vernon's property. You know, it was a very profitable, popular thing to have whiskey. Mm-hmm. As it moved west into Kentucky, the corn was introduced to the rye whiskey idea of making whiskey and then the word bourbon came around obviously from the french mm-hmm. i would think and then you would take you know these farmers that really distilled whiskey back then they had their crops and uh, if you cut your corn and you had 50 bushels of corn you could take that same 50 bushels and turn it into 10 cases of whiskey which is worth a lot more Indeed. than 10 right. than the 50 bushels of corn so it was a way it was used as a I use it today for barbering every now and then, but it was money. It was just like having money. So it yeah. was a very popular thing. Grow some to eat, grow some to profit from. Exactly. Yep. So it's kind of a fun thing. And then the, the whiskey tax came around and the business of making whiskey moved west to kind of get away from the, the tax people who wanted to tax the spirit to pay for the revolution. It's just, again, it's part of this country's history. And it's very important. Mm-hmm. Indeed. Yep. Indeed. Well, Jerry? Yes. We end each interview talking about cocktails as a tip the hat to the cocktail collection. Mm -hmm. So now we know your girls all like a good margarita. Is that (laughs) something that runs in the family? Well, uh, uh, yes. Um, (laughs) I I learned about just like I'm actually a lot more interested in wine than in whiskey just because there's so many more variables and the people and the ground and the dirt and the weather and everything affects it Mm -hmm. a little bit more than whiskey does. I mean, the, the grains in whiskey, but I went to a, a, a tequila tasting in Chicago years and years ago, and different tequilas. And I, you know, didn't know a thing about tequila. I thought Jose Cuervo was the the way to go with that, the gold standard, as it were. Right? Yeah, the sugar water that's flavored like tequila, <laughs> which is right. Mm-hmm. If you've not had a sidebar to our listeners, Jose Cuervo, uh, again, everything Julian just said. However, they do know how to make great tequila, and they have a family reserve that is out of this world. But it's very expensive and very rare. They sure do. And it is fabulous. Yes, yes. So right. anyway, back to Chicago. It's just like, you know, look for the words 100% agave on the label and you're good to go. Yes. But uh, it kind of opened my eyes, just like the first glass of a decent Zinfandel years and years ago. I, you know, that kind of said, wow, this, there is something really special about wine. So learn about tequila. And then there's so many different variables of tequila are just incredible. It seems like every distiller, just like bourbon, has a different flavor profile. So mm-hmm. it's, right. it's something that the margarita has its time and place. Obviously, it's a summertime drink, and a couple of them go a long way. So, <laughs> <laughs> But you have to make them just right. And just like any cocktail, it's all about balance and also not too sweet. So you've got to mix the cocktail with good balance. So obviously, that's very important. But uh, yes, I do. That's a long answer to your short <laughs> question. But yeah, I'm, I do like tequila. Is there any cocktails you like to make with any of your expressions? Yeah. When we were back, when we would promote our whiskeys, Preston and I, we, um, we hooked up with a good friend over in London, which is, as far as I know, that's where the cocktail culture kind of started. Hence, Gary Reagan coming over here to mm-hmm. set up camp and tell people in America about cocktails. Yeah. Well, and Prohibition had a lot to do with that exactly. because there were a lot of Americans who went abroad, right. a lot of great American bartenders who went abroad because they couldn't make a living here anymore. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that's where we really got indoctrinated on really good cocktails. And the takes 10 minutes 
sometimes to make a decent cocktail where most people at a bar it takes about 30 seconds, which is uh, not the way to do it. But you, you, <laughs> right. the, the crafting the cocktail is, is a great thing. So it's a beautiful thing. And, and I guess I'm going to have it on my headstone, but um, you know, better the whiskey, better the cocktail. So Indeed. I'll, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. people don't think that and they think it's terrible that you put really good whiskey, no matter whose whiskey it is, or expensive whiskey in, or aged whiskey into a cocktail. You think you're wasting it. But mm-hmm. no, you, you put a four year old bourbon in with a cocktail and then a 10 or a 15 year old bourbon into the cocktail, you're going to, it's night and day. Mm-hmm. So, right. We love them. I like telling a story. I'm sure Carrie is tired of hearing it, but I'm going to keep using it because it's a good one. Dave Pickrell, who, who you worked with us as a, a whiskey curator. Mm-hmm. Dave, when asked, how does he feel when someone puts one of his, you know, $600 boss hog mm-hmm. or releases in a cocktail? He said, if they're going to pay $600 for my whiskey, they can clean their toilet with it. <laughs> <laughs> nah, that sounds just like Dave. <laughs> yeah. I think well. that's sacrilegious, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, our 15 year old, we suggest, you know, an old fashioned with a 50, our 15 year old pappy is, is an exceptional drink. I could imagine. Um, if, if it's mixed correctly. And I, when I say correctly, there's a lot of ways to do it, but I, sure. we have our, all have our own ways that we like our cocktails made. So, uh, yeah. Well, I have the good fortune, Carrie. I don't think you were at that dinner. We did a multi course, no. neat pour and old rip and pappy cocktail pairing dinner here in Los Angeles in Little Tokyo at uh far bar um i guess about four years ago and it sold out within 18 hours and uh we got a few more seats added and those sold in a few hours but it was immensely successful and immensely satisfying and we had the full range all the way to 23 neat board and there were a couple of cocktails as well not with the 23 but Mm -hmm. i believe it was the 10 and the 15 i could look back at the menu but anyway and so let's just say we've had the good fortune of of experiencing these whiskeys both neat and cocktailed yep Yep. well some of us have some of us haven't yes (laughs) well try it (laughs) you weren't there find it try it or get (laughs) if i can find it yes Uh, although i have had the i think it is the old-fashioned the old-fashioned syrup from Pappy and co and that was delicious yeah, I have, I have a hard time ordering a mixed cocktail out. Back in the day when we used to be able to go out to to dinner or get a drink somewhere. But it was I'm always a little skeptical about somebody just whipping up an old fashioned or a Manhattan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm like, it's not gonna take you ten minutes, I don't want it. <laughs> yeah. I would just tend to put too much of one and not enough of the other. Right. Yeah. The balance right. Is, is just like everything in life is the Yeah. Or there's ice floating at the top of the Manhattan. You're like, Did you shake this? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, Julian, this has been fantastic. I'm so glad we were able to talk to you. The book is out now. You can get it online at pappyandco.com. Um, also, I believe at Amazon, right? And again, the title of the book is Pappy Land, A Story of Family, Fine Bourbon, and the Things That Last by Wright Thompson. It's a great read. I highly recommend it to anybody who's interested in family history of the South and of this wonderful whiskey brand. It's a, it's a great read. Thank you all. It's been fun, and thanks for the interest. Appreciate it. It's nice to be able to sell something for whiskey. Yes. Julian Proctor, we thank you. All yes. right. <laughs> thank you. Glad to be here. And I thank you very much. I know you don't like to do promotions, so this was very nice to have you um, grace your presence with us. So. Sure. Glad to do it. The Center for Culinary Culture, home to the Cocktail Collection and L.A. Food and Drink Museum, has a YouTube channel featuring a mix of how-to, lively talk, and culinary entertainment. Already streaming are Cocktails, The Grand Tour, Culinary Quickies, Music and Booze with Mo, and this podcast, Spirits of Whiskey. New shows coming soon include Complete Greek, telling the story of Greek food one dish at a time, and Spirits of Rum, a podcast featuring personalities from the wide world of cane spirits. Find us on YouTube, the Center for Culinary Culture, and subscribe now. The Center for Culinary Culture, telling the story of food and drink one taste at a time. For show notes on today's podcast, please visit our website at spiritsofwhiskey.com. That's whiskey with an E. To learn more about the secondary market, we'll include links to supporting documents from today's Whiskey Chronicles. As always, you'll see upcoming topics, a guest roster, and links to past shows. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, salon. Slunch of all. You can become a sustaining supporter of Spirits of Whiskey by making a monthly donation. 
just visit the Spirits of Whiskey page at anchor.fm. That's anchor.fm forward slash spirits dash of dash whiskey and click on the support button. And if you really like us, give us a five star rating and a review. Thank you. Spirits of Whiskey is produced by First Real Entertainment and the Center for Culinary Culture, home of the Cocktail Collection, and is available via Anchor, Apple, Google, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and wherever fine podcasts are heard.